Good morning and welcome to the fourth meeting of the COVID-19 Recovery Committee in 2023. This morning we will continue our inquiry into long COVID and I would like to welcome to the meeting Jane Claire Judson, the Chief Executive Officer of Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland, Dr Amy Small, Clinical Advisor of Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland, who joins us online, Dr David Shackles, Joint Chair of the Royal College of General Practitioners in Scotland, and Lorraine Crothers, board member, Royal College of Occupational Therapists, who joins us online. And, and Dr. Claire Taylor, TASA Complete Health Limited and expert advisor on long COVID to the World Health Network, who will be joining us online very shortly. Thank you, and thank you for giving us your time this morning and, all, and for your written submissions. We estimate that this session will run up to about 10 past 10, and each member will have approximately 10 minutes each to speak to the panel and ask their questions. For those witnesses who are attending remotely this morning, if you'd like to respond to an issue being discussed, please type R in the chat and we'll try to bring you in. And I'm keen to ensure that everybody gets an opportunity to speak, and I apologise in advance, therefore, if time runs on too much, I may have to interrupt members and witnesses in the interest of brevity. Can I invite witnesses to briefly introduce themselves? Can I start with you, Dr Shackles? Yes, thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. I'm David Shackles. I'm a GP in Perth and Schoon, and one of the joint chairs, along with Chris Williams, of the Royal College of General Practitioners in Scotland. Much. Jane? Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm Jane Claire Judson. I'm the Chief Executive of Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland, and we've been working on long COVID um, since late on 2020. Thank you, Jane. Dr Amy Small? Thank you. I'm Dr Amy Small. I'm Clinical Advisor to Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland. I'm a practising GP and I'm also living with long COVID. Thank you very much. And Lorraine? Therapist currently offering long COVID service in Glasgow. Thank you. And Dr. Claire Taylor. Hi there. I'm uh, Dr. Taylor. I'm a GP um, in uh, Tayside and I also run a long COVID clinic, a private clinic in Dundee. And I also work, work with the World Health Network, with, um, with the World Health Network as an advisor on long COVID. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. I'm turning to questions now. Um, and if I can ask the first question, Dr. Taylor, as a GP running a private practice that specialises in long COVID treatment, what do you think the NHS could improve in long COVID treatment and services based on your experience? Thank you. Um, so in my clinic, um, the main person seeing the patients is, is myself as the doctor. So whenever I see a patient, I assess them all individually, look at any tests they might have had, look at what they might not have had, look at the pathophysiology of long COVID and what underpins it, and from that work out what is likely to be wrong with that particular person. From there, there I can then give them treatment and uh, stabilise them, treat them for conditions such as POTS, which is not happening on the NHS, treating them for uh, mass cell activation, which is not really happening on the NHS, and sort of coordinate their care as a whole. Once they are stable, then they can start to rehabilitate. But up until that point, it's not really happening in the NHS that they're getting the coordinated care. And uh, a doctor who's dedicated to their care in the one place. And I, and I do think the NHS could improve by having the long COVID clinics in each health board with a doctor to oversee the, the, each patient's journey and direct their care. Thank you, um, Dr. Taylor. That's very helpful. I'm going to move on to the um, question of what training on long COVID is available for healthcare professionals and how can healthcare professionals, including GPs, be encouraged to undertake training on long COVID. If I can bring yourself in, Dr Shackles. Yes, yeah, thanks very much. Um, the Royal College of GPs has produced some information um, and resources on long COVID, uh, both online modules and also has done some webinars on long COVID as well. And that's encouraged GPs to access those them themselves. 
One of the difficulties we've had in Scotland is that even pre-pandemic, the Protected Learning Time initiative uh, was in abeyance. And so that restricted the ability of GPs and their teams to meet together and to take part in any educational activities. So that's been a negative uh, impact. And we, we hope over the next uh, months, hopefully, to be able to restart that initiative, working along with partners in the BMA and Scottish Government. Uh, but that has been the fact over the, uh, the, the period of the pandemic, which I think has held back some areas of, uh, of education. I think the other thing is, is uh, accessing um, good uh, information about uh, on COVID that is digestible and practical. Um, and that's where the, the RCGP initiatives came in. But uh, sometimes there is a paucity of other uh, locally uh, available information for GBase to access to see what's practically available in their own areas. Thank you very much. Um, just with my experience and from witnesses that we've had previously, there, there's been some people that say there's, there's no awareness within local GPs, but it, my experience going to my local GP last week, there were signs up all over the place saying, if you've got long COVID, please um, talk to a doctor now. So I think it's varied from place to place, but I'll move on to Murdo. Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, witnesses. I should say, um, in case it's uh, a conflict of interest, I'm a registered as a patient with Dr Shackle's practice, but by the grace of God, I don't trouble him or his colleagues very much um, so far anyway. Um, can I ask about the question of um, the level of demand for long COVID? Because we believe there's 175,000 long COVID sufferers in, in, in Scotland. And I'm interested to, to explore whether there's enough capacity in the system to try and um, help that level of demand. Uh, clearly, some of these people will not be coming forward looking for support at the moment. Is there capacity in the system to support them? And specifically, is there an issue with inequalities? Are there particular groups more likely to be affected, for example, women rather than men or people with disabilities who might require additional support? Um, Dr Shackles, do you want to start with that one? Yes, thanks very much. I think they're all very uh, good questions, and it's, it's a vast area to explore. Um, certainly, our experience, because we have uh, cast out to our membership asking, you know, before this uh, committee hearing, was what was their experience around uh, people coming forward for long COVID? And we didn't find people feeling that they were overwhelmed with it. But we're also aware that the self-reporting, or when you do the surveys, that there seem to be more people out there who feel they have long COVID, but they don't seem to be uh, reporting to us. And that may be an issue. That's a problem. You know, we need to, to, to see and hear from people if they have a condition that potentially we can help with. I think the other thing is, is from the um, disadvantaged population's point of view, we are aware that in, you know, health equality, inequalities exist. And when we've uh, asked our, some of our practices uh, in deep end practices where they deal with more deprivation. Again, they report seeing uh, and hearing less from people with uh, potential long COVID. So there is an issue with that. I think we're aware that this may be a condition that presents more women may uh, have the condition. And certainly um, some of our patients with disabilities, particularly learning disabilities, we're not hearing from, we're not sure why that is, and whether we're getting good access uh, and, and help for them. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Amy Small, I think you want to come in. Thank you. Um, yeah, you asked about um, sort of numbers. I think 85% of people living with long COVID um, are of working age. So we need to remember that these are people who have got caring responsibilities, both the young and the old. And um, I feel upfront investment in their care is going to lead to long term support for them being back as functioning members of the community, able to work and, for, and, and work in society. I mean, people aren't presenting because they've been repeatedly told that there's nothing on offer for them. So they're at home dealing with it on their own because there hasn't been anything for them there to date. And I think also as a person living with long COVID who signed up to a lot of um, surveys and, and qualitative research initially, I received survey after survey after survey every month. And it's very tiresome to keep filling out forms when one isn't feeling well, and also filling out forms every month for nearly three years now to say that you're still not feeling well. I confess, I've not filled out one of those surveys for over two years because it just didn't feel like it was getting me anywhere or anyone else. So whilst I think there's a perception that people are getting better, actually, I think it's a lot of people just aren't presenting and aren't telling us that they're still unwell. And I think we need to be really aware of that. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Taylor, I think you want to come in. Hi, thank you. Um, I am completely and utterly overwhelmed 
I've seen hundreds of patients. Um, and just a little bit of background is that I started this sort of work a couple of years ago for a charity um, and um, online. And the long COVID patients started to come forward at the start of 2021. And the charity actually went bust um, in the pandemic at the start of 2022. And at that point, I uh, you know, worked with the local health board to see if I could set up a clinic on the NHS. And unfortunately, there was not enough money to provide a doctor. So at that point, I was either going to not do anything at all or do it privately. Obviously, there is an inequality there. If people have to pay, do it. But it was either going to be that or nothing. Um, the majority of my patients are female. They are usually working age. They are usually previously hit, fit and well, on no medications usually to start with. And they are plunged into an utter nightmare from the start. They go on a wild goose chase trying to go to various different specialties. And they, at the moment, um, don't really get much of a coordination in their care. They often find their way to me because you know, patients talk online, they've got support groups, etc. And I'm utterly overwhelmed. I'm booked up for months uh, and people where you know I'm overwhelmed with all of the stories of their journeys and how difficult they found it um to, to access care. And the, the other thing I wanted to say was I do virtual consultations. So I see the patients who are bed bound who's who can't even speak to me actually. A lot of the time it's their their parents for carers, because even talking for 10 minutes exhausts these people to the point where they cannot function. So those people often can't access healthcare. They can't make it to NHS clinics. They're not going to be going to a rehab clinic to do uh, physio. They're bed bound. And although that's not the, the biggest part of long COVID, it's still a part where people can't access healthcare and are, are you know, unable to to even speak a lot of the time. But it is it is quite eye opening to be doing the virtual consultations as well as face to face and anyone in the country can access my clinic, anyone in the UK can access it. And anyone with long COVID or ME or any of those conditions can access it. But the the I I have seen I can't even count how many people I've seen since the start of the pandemic. Okay, th thank you, Dr. Taylor. I, I, I know Lorraine Crothers wants to come in, but can I just follow up one one point with you, Dr. Taylor, which I think is quite relevant. I mean, you, you've yes. obviously, you know, developed a, a specialism in this particular field. Are you the only person in Scotland who's who's got that level of specialism? Do you think, or are there others as well? Uh, well, I mean, I've done hundreds of hours of meetings across the world with um, various groups that are working on long COVID. I've read every paper there is to read on long COVID. Um, I think there's some integrated medicine doctors possibly that do, do a bit of long COVID, but I'm not aware of anyone else that has has the, this level of interest or knowledge and has seen as many patients as I have. And as I said, it just sort of led on from working from an ME charity and naturally patients found their way to somebody that could help. I, I don't think there's anyone else doing POTS either. So POTS is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. About 50% of long COVID patients have it. Basically, when they stand up, their heart rate goes up. It can double. It can go up. It could even go up to 200 beats per minute washing the dishes. So we, as far as I know, there is not a POTS service in Scotland. So I, I have taken that on too and be, become an expert in managing POTS as well. And, and I find it really interesting and I really want, want to help the patients. But I, I'm not sure it's a... A, a GP, generally a GP thing to be able to manage all of this. I think it has to be a special interest and you have to work at it and keep up to date and be interested. Okay, th thank you very much. Um, Lorraine, I think you wanted to come in. Thank you. Just to add to some of the points already raised this morning, um, I currently work for a health board and we employ 38,000 staff members. And of those, we've had referrals for 676 um, patients between the period of July 21 and February 2023. We suspect that there are also staff members who still have yet to be referred. You asked about um, demographics. So predominantly, the people that we're seeing are female, very much of working age, because obviously we're an employer. They're presenting with, on average, 12 symptoms, the most overriding one being um, cognitive fatigue. 
And I suppose the, the Royal College of OTs is interested in the medical management of patients with long COVID, but we're also very much keen to um, express the need for rehab services and for sufferers of long COVID, COVID to be able to access a range of multidisciplinary team members. So the medics is very much one part of it, but we also need to see the occupational therapists, the physiotherapists and our other AHP colleagues offering support to clients to manage um, all the normal activities and routines that they really need to engage in to be active members of society and to engage in the things that are important to them. And in, quite, in response to some of the questions about where are people going? So there are some small dedicated services, but we also were aware from our members that there are services absorbing some of the referrals. So we've got information from our occupational therapy colleagues in Edinburgh working in children and young people services. And they're very much seeing um, children being referred into the rheumatology services in particular. And what they're struggling with is onward referral for these young people. So how do they access their mainstream education, et cetera, again, um, finding pathways for them and support. We've also got a really good example of our colleagues in NHS Lanarkshire. So we have occupational therapists working in primary care settings, two GP practices in particular, who were able to work alongside the GPs and see some of the patients um, with long COVID in those practices and support them back to their normal routines and activities. So occupational therapists are key in this. They're one part of it and the medical aspect of it is another. And it's really about reinforcing the multidisciplinary aspect of patients' needs. So thank you for that opportunity. Th th thank you. Dr Taylor, did you want to come back in briefly? Helpful and obviously very grateful to OTE and physio and everything for what they do. I just wanted to say something about the pathophysiology of long COVID and the, rehab, the rehabbing of it. So long COVID, I, I'm not sure if most people know what it is. They think they know what it is, but they don't. And it is... A, it is a vasculitis, it is an inflammation of the blood vessels. Every part of your body has a blood supply. And all part that's why it's a multi-system disease. The immune system isn't working properly, it's overactive. So a bit like people who have autoimmune disease, when people try to do things, their immune system activates and they feel like they've got flu, for example. Um, and when you have a vasculitis, usually, so there's other forms of vasculitis, and, and we know this about COVID because there's thousands of research papers. When you've got a vasculitis, usually you're under a whole team of people, like the, the OT was saying, uh, an MDT, but you would never try to rehab somebody with vasculitis without, without giving them treatment. And that is what's missing. And we have to always go back to the pathophysiology to look at how what the condition is. And then there is a spectrum of mild, you know, mild disease up to severe. But the pathophysiology is poorly understood by most people, and it is a vasculitis. And it is worth reading up further on what a vasculitis is. And only once we target that, and, and there are studies ongoing, into, there's a study down in England at the moment stimulating ICP. Once we target that, that is when we will probably be able to treat people and, and rehab people. Um, and so it's just a reminder that there's this is not a psychological disorder. This is not, you know, thinking yourself better or you know having you know positive thoughts this is this is a, a medical condition with roots in the blood vessels and long covid is canaries in the coal mine because the increase the, the increased risk of an mi after covid is 50% for 18 months afterwards that is a stunning statistic and the canaries in the coal mine are getting symptoms of long covid the rest are not, they are just having the heart attack um, with the same pathology un underlying it. And again, we know that there are, there are, there are hundreds of studies. Um, but I'm grateful for all of the MDT and, everybody, and I wish I had a whole MDT here with me back home. Um, but it's just a little bit on the pathophysiology and we don't usually rehab people untreated with these sort of diseases. Thank you. I'll be fine. We've got time. I think Jane Clare Judson, you want to come in? Yeah. Thank you. Just um, very briefly, I totally agree with what the rest of the panel has said um, on, on this issue. I just wanted to um, focus a little bit on the health inequalities part. We know that COVID itself affected disadvantaged groups more. Um, so that's, it's obvious it's going to therefore come through in terms of long COVID. I just particularly wanted to pick up on women presenting. So we know that if women present with certain symptoms, um, that they may, might be judged in certain ways 
So if they talk about feeling anxious or feeling palpitations, that is quite often put down to a mental health or a psychological issue. And we have to be really careful with that, I think, around long COVID. I think there's certainly a feeling that women feel dismissed in general. Um, that's why we've got a women's health plan. So we need to really take account of that in terms of designing the services to make sure that those biases, which we all have um, and that we all have to challenge ourselves on, are tackled as part of this, because it is a majority women who are presenting with long COVID and of course a lot of women were on the front line of COVID itself in those caring positions so we need to take that into account when designing those services. Thank you. Thank you. Alex Rally, would you like to come in please? Yeah, thank you Convener. Um, good morning. Can I start by asking about the capacity within the NHS because it's fine for, for us to listen to all the experts that tell us what, what needs to be put together but the capacity to do that. So, so the Royal Co College of General Practitioners say increased in long-term investment and access to therapies based on communities such as physiotherapy, occupational therapy, specialist rehabilitation services are important. And then the Royal, uh, the, the sorry, the Royal College of occupational therapists talk about the belief that there is a lack of awareness of how occupational therapy and rehabilitation services can support individuals, but. My day-to-day my -day finding is that where people need those services in the community just now, those services are lacking. I think NHS 5, for example, has, has said they have shortages of just not being able to recruit, recruit OTs and a whole range of medical professionals. So what is the capacity within the NHS right now to deal with all the other um, pressures that are there? Is there enough capacity? And Therefore, is there a, a joined-up disciplinary approach to, to tackling long COVID? If so, could somebody go to their GP and then be referred here, there and wherever? What's the capacity like? I'll, I'll start with, sorry, um, with, with um, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Shekels. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, the capacity within the health service, even pre-pandemic, was poor. Uh, we've been making that point for many years. Certainly within general practice, our capacity was poor pre-pandemic and it's poor now. Uh, over the last three years, uh, there's been a very small rise in the headcount number of general practitioners, but there's been a drop of 3% in the whole time equivalent number of general practitioners. And that's not good enough. That means that the increasing workload, because uh, over that period, the population of Scotland went up by 2%. So we've got a dropping work uh, force for a rising workload. And that's not just with our new and emerging condition of long COVID, that's all the other conditions as well. We're in this very difficult part of remobilization and trying to get, uh, get through the backlog of multiple other conditions as well. And I have to say that in general practice, we're struggling. Over the last uh, year, we've had, you know, look, COVID has not gone away, acute COVID has not gone away, and we're getting increasing burdens of long COVID. We've had influenza, we've had streptococcus A uh, um, uh, infections as well. And all these things have sapped the, the, the strength of general practice with a small workload. So our workforce is, is, is down. As Amy has said, a great number of the, the health workforce has <coughs> itself been affected by COVID and long COVID as well, and that's had an effect too. So we've got reduced workforce because of illness. And that's not just looking at the, uh, the other areas within the, um, the, the, the workforce of OTs and physios and pharmacists and our other colleagues as well, where we have still not had a good enough workforce. And so we're now trying to, uh, you know, to, to, to create capacity, which is difficult because all the other conditions still need treating as well. We're very well aware, and the Chief Medical Officer has put out um, you know, le letters of concern all th all from all of the, the, the four nations indicating the potential um, rise of um, uh, heart disease once again because we've not been focusing on secondary prevention during the pandemic. So we have lots of these risks that we're trying to, trying to mitigate, but with a, 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 smaller, a too smaller workforce. OK, thank you. Um, Dr Small? Thank you. Um, I sort of feel we need to turn it on its head. Yes, we know that there is no capacity, but I don't think we can single out long COVID as an individual illness that we want to pick on as to whether or not we're going to manage it because there isn't capacity. You know, we, we, we can't pit one condition against another. We have good multidisciplinary care for diabetes, for example. Every patient with diabetes will have an ophthalmologist, have a podiatrist, they'll have a GP, they'll have a specialist nurse. 
this is what we need in long COVID and we can't single it out as just another thing because these people aren't going away. This condition's not going away and it's going to continue to develop. I still see people developing long COVID in the last couple of months who have who have had COVID recently and we know that COVID is still rife in our community. I'm working in the GP practice today who several staff members are off because of COVID. I think we in... in um, in the third sector have capacity. So Chest Heart Stroke Scotland, our advice line, have been doing amazing work helping people with their breathlessness and fatigue management, pacing advice. Pacing is absolutely key. And Claire, Claire will back me up on that. Um, for, for whatever stage of long COVID you're in, pacing can be really, really helpful to learn how to conserve your energy. So third sector has capacity, but we've really got to free up the ability um, for, for health boards and general practice to be able to refer into us where we can take some of that workload off the NHS. We've got time in chest heart stroke to spend with patients. The advice line team have on average about an hour per patient. That's time that we can't offer them in primary care. GPs don't have that time to give to patients and we have the ability to do that. And just a little thing about the, the, the fact that so many NHS workers are affected by long COVID. The BMA have run a survey, which we're still waiting on results to come out. But over 570 doctors in the UK filled out that survey who are all people who have long COVID. If I had been diagnosed with my POTS earlier in my journey, I never would have lost my job. If I had seen the right people early on in my journey, I would have been able to continue being a GP partner in East Lothian. And I think that's the big difference is the earlier we get in there with the treatment and management, the earlier we get back to work. And then we can continue to look after the people that need us the most. OK, thank you. And um, Maureen Crothers. Hi, yes, I'll keep it brief. It's really just to echo some of the comments of the other members in the panel there. So. The, we surveyed our members and actually what members are saying is that they're having to absorb the extra referrals that are coming from long COVID. So we, we have we have issues with capacity as it is, and then we're trying to get staff to pick up and um, see and treat people with long COVID on top of that. I'm working for a health board in occupational health just now, and, and I'm very aware of the number of staff members who are of um, sick with COVID. And I'm also talking to those who are transitioning back to work and the environments in which they find themselves working in is, is quite worrying because of the number of staff who are off sick. So we have much less capacity in the system to deal with this. I think what we're really interested is in um, increased investment in services that already are ex in existence. So, you know, putting more investment into current community and rehab services, getting more investment into the primary care services so that we're, as Amy said, picking up people at a much quicker and earlier stage to prevent the longer term impacts of the condition on people's health, well-being, but also you know, their economic productivity, etc. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. And Jane, did you want to come in? Thank you. Um, it's really on that issue of capacity and, and what that means. Um, I, I totally <coughs> agree with what's been said, that the, the NHS is under pressure. We all know that. But with the capacity that we've got, we could work better and smarter. Um, and that's, that's where the multidisciplinary team comes in. At the moment, people are ping-ponging between services and between um, specialisms without much coordination. And that, that's not helping the capacity issue. So I think there's a real um, sense that we, we could sort that. That's something that we can do now. Um, it, it's difficult to hark back to the past because we want to look to the future, but this is an issue that was flagged two and a half years ago by Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland saying we will need to raise training and awareness, we will need to look at the capacity issue and we will need to plan for that. At that point, we didn't realise there was going to be 175,000 people with COVID, at long COVID. At that point, we thought there might be 30 or 40,000 and we were saying we're going to have to look at capacity. That message, for some reason, has not got through over the past two and a half years. So there's a lesson now that we can't wait another two and a half years um, to get that right. Um, goodness knows what it will look like then. Um, and, and for people like Amy going through that journey, that, that is absolutely terrible. Um, I also think there's something around, we want all of our clinical colleagues to operate at the top of their licence. So there's things that we, could, we can do at Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland about that support around self-management and, and supporting people through that end of their journey and that part of the journey that we don't really want um, clinicians spending uh, the 10 minutes that they might have with someone trying to solve all of that at once. As Amy said, we can spend a lot more time um, with individuals, but also at different times. Um, so we're not maybe qu quite as constrained in terms of saying it must be at this time on a Monday. We can be flexible around that and support people around where they are at home um, with their condition. And that, that's, a, that's a key offer that we've made um, throughout this whole discussion um, and that we'd really like to see taken up. My final point is, is that um, I would love for us at Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland to be overwhelmed 
with people with long COVID. And at the moment, we are not overwhelmed. And the reason for that is the referral process. So people might be signposted to us if they're lucky, if that happens. But in general, what we need is that integrated service. So we set up our service to be integrated with the NHS. We didn't want to be standalone, just off to the side doing our own thing that wasn't integrated and wasn't helpful in, in, in freeing up that capacity. But what we've now got is exactly that. And we need to sort that out. And, and I would love to come back in a year's time and say, oh, my goodness, we were overwhelmed, but we've sorted a lot of the issues. That would be a much better place to be. I'm going to bring Claire Taylor in, but before I do, can I just ask you briefly, so who, who at NHS level needs to take responsibility to ensure that you have this much more joined up approach in terms of GPs are run off their feet? I mean, you know, the amount of certainly correspondence I get every other week for people complaining about issues, uh, they're totally run off their feet. How do we, or who, who, who should take responsibility to ensure that these services are working together, are joined up and there's clear pathways? Is that the NHS board? Is that somebody within the NHS board? Who is that? Could I maybe ask Dr Shackles first? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I absolutely agree with everything Jane James said uh, there. Um, we do need to, to think about capacity planning and we need space to be able to do that um, as, as GPs. Um, one of the things that we've been pressing for from the uh, Royal College of GPs is better uh, interface uh, between primary and secondary care so that we can actually discuss these pathways and have them better signposts in local areas. Um, and that's not happening at the moment. Um, and there are some, some, some honourable mentions. I think you know, the, the Lothian uh, Ref Help Guide is very useful because it actually can set out and so GPs can see a single point of access where they might want to be able to refer into. But that's not... That's not uniform across Scotland. So we do need clearer pathways that GPs and patients then know how they can access it, how to get into the system, and then know what's available. Because sometimes what happens is services change and services morph over time inevitably and, uh, uh, and hopefully improve. Then patients may ask, you know, what's going to happen to me? And a lot of the time GPs won't know. And, and that's very that's dispiriting for patients if we don't know as their health professional what's going to happen to them. That's, that doesn't give them great confidence. So we need to have better direction into the pathways that need to be smoother, simpler, uh, easier to access to all the modalities, both to both um, specialist care, if that's required, through either cardiology, respiratory, whatever, to the rehabilitation pathways, and also to third sector as well. But who can make that happen? Who, who, who should be leading on that? Is it the chief executive of the board that should be saying this needs to be put in place? You know, who, who needs to be well, managing? I think, I, I think it probably has to be the chief executive of the board. I think it has to be we're, we're working in a situation where we have 14 territorial boards, for better or worse, with each board setting up a service in their own area. Now, there may be some um, you know, discussions and, and sensibilities about having uh, a super regional service for the most severe cases, but for patients in their area, they are best treated in their own area, in their own area closer to home, and the boards need to make sure that they have the, the, the system sorted out. Jane? Um, thank you. And, sorry, I'm just going to mention that my, my full name is Jane Clare, and when people are calling me Jane, it makes me think it's my mum. Oh, sorry, so, Jane. <laughs> <Right>, sorry. <laughs> um, so that's stressing me out. Um, so um, just on, the, on the, the who should take responsibility for the sort of coordination, um, I, you know, I think David's right that the chief executives of health boards have to take their responsibility and their accountability on that, and, and we've seen, you know, the, the, the diversity um, that's happening there at health board level. I would also argue, though, that there does need to be that national steering. Um, and I know that you're going to be hearing from others who are, who are going to talk about that. I think from our perspective, um, the challenge we've had there is that there's, there's been three versions of that national seating happening, and, and none of them have really come to the fruition that we would expect to see. I've got no doubt that the two cabinet secretaries that we've worked with have been committed to long COVID and believe in long COVID. They, they're not arguing that it's not a condition or that, or that it doesn't exist. But there's definitely something that's happened around when we've agreed plans, or we've agreed a course of action, that then it sort of disappears and we don't see it coming back out into implementation and, and action for people with long COVID. I'm sure there's lots of work happening behind the scenes somewhere. I'm really hoping that there is. Um, but we don't see that coming out on the ground. And, and, and that's a real challenge is the implementation piece. And that, that does need to be nationally coordinated, I think, to share that good practice and, and to ensure that health boards are able to tackle the issues they've got on the ground. OK, and finally, Claire Taylor. The fact that... A lot of people are still getting long COVID, and I think reinfections are going to be an issue uh, because people are being reinfected sometimes within a few months, and uh, often people are on their fourth or fifth infection by now. Um, Capacity-wise, I've got a good overview of Scotland, you know, with having patients from all over Scotland, and 
now, I don't think there is an issue with seeing the GP. I think patients are seeing their GPs and they, they, on the whole, from what I gather, with some exceptions, but on the whole, had good support and the GPs are trying really hard to work out what to do with them. Uh, they often seem quite happy to see me to take over whatever I suggest because somebody is giving some input. The problems seem to come when it's referrals into different specialties. So somebody with long COVID might need a cardiology referral for chest pain, a respiratory referral for shortness of breath, a neurology referral for um, pins and needles in their hands and feet, um, an OT referral, a physio referral. Um, and the waiting times are varied for each service. And it's variable who they will get at the end of that service. So they may well go to cardiology with their chest pain. The referral can be refused. And I have to say, there are lots of rejected referrals. So somebody with chest pain isn't usually rejected from cardiology. But if the word long COVID is attached to it, it seems to make it easier for whoever is sifting through these to say, sorry, no, we're not seeing them. Um, true story, I, a couple of years ago, referred somebody to cardiology for POTS um, and as a GP, because obviously I, I, I'm a GP as well in, in practice. And I got a letter, I got a rejected referral back saying, sorry, we have no expertise in POTS, get them to visit the POTS UK website. The POTS UK website tells them all about the medications that they could have if somebody prescribed them. Um, so th at that point, I became very determined that I would be somebody that would be able to do that. But that was a rejected referral, and there were reje rejected referrals all through the system. And I know there is massive pressures in the system. I totally understand that. But we t either having rejected referrals and GPs writing back and back and back, saying, please see this patient, or waiting a year for each service, and each service they don't, you know, they don't interact. That's just that's the way the system is. Uh, and I think I would agree there needs to be a national level of a model. Uh, and maybe there could be some individual changes across health boards, but I think there needs to be a national agreed model whereby, as I think it was David was saying, there's an access for GPs to get these tests, for, for example. Um, maybe there's a, a referral pathway where um, you can go straight to test. And I think you know, GPs with some education could direct people, you know, who, who needs to have, you know, an exercise tolerance test and who needs to have cardiac MRI. You might want a, a cardiologist going through the referrals, but they might not need to see the patient to decide that. And at the moment, I think it's just taking too long there's too many rejected referrals, and I have to say, sometimes at the end of that, when they do see someone, I hear a lot of trauma from patients, uh, and it's quite a lot to take on as one person. To, and it's nothing compared to what they went through, but I hear the same story over and over again of getting to the person eventually and being told that long COVID isn't real or that they are just overweight, overweight or they're just anxious. Thank you, Dr. Turner. I'm sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm just going to have to interrupt. It's just that I'm really conscious of time here and we've got three members that we need to get through. So I'll move to John Mason, please. Hey, thanks very much, hey, convener. If I could start maybe with Dr. Shackles. Hey, in Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland, in their submission, said hey, while most GPs have heard of long COVID, so, so that suggests that some GPs have not heard of long COVID. Hey, they also say... Most concerningly, there remain clinicians who dispute that long COVID exists. So I just wondered if you could react to these statements. I would certainly be very surprised if GPs had not heard of long COVID. Um, I don't have any um, uh, either survey or research evidence that tells me how, how much um, GPs believe in the condition. Uh, certainly, in all the information that we put out, one of the important things uh, is to make sure that we believe our patients and listen to them. That is one of the critical parts of our, of our job. Um, on an individual GP basis, I, 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 I don't know, I can't comment, and I have not had any feedback that that is the case. OK, thank you. Can I ask Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland, you, do you stand by that, that some GPs have not heard of long COVID? We certainly stand by the fact that that's what patients have reported to us, that when they've been in an appointment with a GP, they've said, oh, I, don't, I don't know what this is, I don't understand what this is. So we, we certainly stand by that. And we stand by the patient experience in terms of, um, I, I would say that people with long COVID are the experts in this at the moment. 
um, you know, they're the people who have been living with the condition, who have been engaging with the service, and have that insight as to what the journey, such as it is, um, exists. Um, and certainly from the, the submissions that the committee has received itself from individuals with long COVID, that, that thread runs through. Is that sense that either people don't believe it, they've not heard of it, they don't understand it. Um, and, and like David's saying, it's not all GPs, um, but it, there's enough uh, happening there for people to report that to us and, and to come through in, in numbers through the, the submissions to the committee. Um, I think as well what we have to Can think I just ask you, I mean, if I break my arm or have cancer, I am not the expert. The, the, the GP or the, the, the specialist is the expert. Why, why is it different with long COVID? I think the reason why there's a difference happening with long COVID is that it was people with long COVID who termed it long COVID and started to identify what was happening with that condition um, way back in sort of August 2020, so of September, August 2020. And when we talk about expert, we talk about the expert patient. They're living with the condition. So yes, they're not a specialist who can diagnose, but they are the person who understands fundamentally what it means to them and how it's affecting their life. And that's something that we would stand by as a third sector organisation is saying that if someone is presenting to you and telling you that this is their journey, just as David says, believe them. That, that, you know, we, we don't believe that people are going to their GP lying about long COVID and, and, and trying to make it up. So from that perspective, I would say that they are the experts. And, and very uniquely in this condition, um, it's not something that's been discovered um, by the medical community and then has been you know, taken out to people to diagnose them or to find people with that condition. This is something that we should have been doing and have been doing in partnership to a great extent. But it is people with long COVID who have pushed this right. and have okay. campaigned I think Dr Small, you wanted to come in? Thank you. I mean, one thing I would go back to is what Jane Clare was saying earlier about a lot of women being affected by this and that um, the bias that continues to run through a lot of society in terms of female related problems or women who are suffering from these issues. I spoke to a leading cardiologist in Scotland the other day who works for a large health board who told me that the vast majority of his cardiological consultants don't believe in POTS. He's the only one in the whole of that health board that believes in POTS. And he admitted that to me. Um, I think we have to take that very seriously because his colleagues, if, and he said, and he said, excuse the pun, it's potluck as to who patients get when they get referred to cardiology with long COVID symptoms that mimic POTS or are POTS related issues. So I think we have to listen to our colleagues. Our colleagues are telling us that, that our colleagues don't believe in it. And we cannot ignore that. I have been to so many meetings and even um, government advisors I, I, there was a Scottish government put on a webinar for GP teaching in October 2021. There were three government advisors, clinicians from health boards around Scotland, and one of them um, stated that it was um, predominantly women who had um, overweight and anxiety who stared at their Fitbits too much that were suffering from long COVID. And I'm, you know, that that's what's coming through at the top level, and this is this is happening, and we can't deny that. OK, thanks very much. If I could return to Dr Shackles, in your submission you say most people gradually recover, but a small percentage continue to have long-term symptoms. Is, is that based on data and studies and so on? That's based on the information that I've received from the, uh, the, the, the reading and learning that I've done, yes. So uh, we believe that you know, uh, uh, long COVID is common to start off with. Uh, many people will have mild symptoms that they will recover from, but some people have severe symptoms that are ongoing. I've got patients who are ongoing with symptoms after two years, uh, but that's a minority. What we don't know is what happens if this is a relapsing remitting condition, if symptoms will recur over the period as well, even if they've been mild, mild symptoms. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, you, one of the issues that's come up quite a lot is should we have dedicated long COVID clinics or, or not? And if I'm understanding your paper correctly, you say patients need a GP assessment and investigation rather than being funnelled inappropriately into a clinic that is designed for one condition. So I assume that means somebody have, has multiple issues, one of which might be long COVID, but if they go straight to the long COVID clinic, a lot of other stuff it might be missed. And, and you also go on to say, we note that the English clinics have been hugely expensive for the number of patients treated. So. Is your argument very much that we, we stick to the GP model and don't go down the long COVID model? 
I think what we need to do. Clinic model. Yeah, yeah I, I think we need to, to to look at the evidence that's coming out from those clinics and and how cost effective and uh, effective for treating the patients patients are. So we're not particularly wedded to one model or not. But at the moment, is this that question of resource um, and what what a, a long COVID clinic looks like? Because, you, as, as has been said before by colleagues, you have to have the secondary care um, specialists who are interested and experts in the various areas that, that, that we're talking about, be it POTS or mast cell act activation, whatever it is for that. So you've got to find those specialists first of all. And then and that's across each, each health board area, potentially. So we've got to make sure that's there and to make sure that we've got the resource within the cardiology um, or respiratory medicine to be able to do that, to put these clinics together. Uh, and at the moment, in my area, I'm, I'm not seeing that. I'm not seeing that being uh, available. So certainly, uh, for um, to be able to refer into long COVID clinics, it will offer appropriate um, medical advice, either from people with an interest, that's OK, I, I approve of that, and very much also for the, from the rehabilitation system as well, where you've got experts or people who understand what needs to be uh, done uh, for the rehabilitation of patients with uh, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, dietetics as well. Okay, thanks so much. Dr Taylor, did you want to come in? Just going to read something out from the, the Scottish study, our very own study in Scotland, KC et al. Uh, and the results were between 6 and 18 months following symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection, almost half of those infected reported no or incomplete recovery. Whilst recovery states remain constant over follow-up for most, 13% reported improvement over time and 11% deterioration. So from that study, which is a large study in Scotland, no people are not recovering by a year. It's just, it's just to show there is some evidence for, for, for those numbers. And that's probably why the, the numbers aren't going down particularly. OK, thank you. And Dr Thanks. Small? I think if we can get this model of care right for long COVID, we can get this right for so many chronic diseases. What I would love to see is, is an integrated approach to this, because actually there are many other diseases, ME, um, rheumatoid arthritis, other chronic conditions where people suffer long term. And if we can get that model right with a multidisciplinary team approach, then actually we can make this better for a huge number of patients across Scotland, not just those living with long COVID. Hertfordshire have a very good model, um, which a GP uh, with a special interest in long COVID is based, she's um, employed by the local CCG, and she has access to physiotherapy and all the other allied health professionals, but she also has direct access to tests, just like Dr Taylor was talking about. It doesn't have to be lots of consultants sitting around a table, but it needs someone who has access directly to those people for further advice. So there are models in England that work well, and I agree with Dr. Um, Dr. Shackles. There are some that don't work so well, but I don't think we can tar um, the brush with all of them. Right. I think, I think I'm, just, I'm just going to come back to you, Ms. Judson, anyway. Um, but you can say something else if you want. But my final point was going to be, I think your paper is critical of the committee for not meeting enough sufferers of long COVID. And I just wondered how many you thought we should meet. Should we meet 100? Should we meet 1,000? How many should we meet? I guess I'll, I'll take that one first. I think um, we did feedback to the committee um, quite openly about how we felt about the consultation process, and that was based on the feedback from um, our long COVID peer support group and, and people with long COVID. Um, I don't think it's about necessarily 100 or 1,000. I think it's about the multi ways in which you engage with people with long COVID. So, for example, we know that it's a condition where you can have brain fog, where you can be tired, um, and also that the engagement with various processes can be quite challenging. So it's about looking at how it is that you engage across multi channels and, and giving people an opportunity over a period of time. And I think that's that's really important. Um, I think there's also something just around the, the, the fact of um, it's, it, how it is that you continue to engage with people with long COVID over the course of the inquiry. So uh, how it is that you continue to keep those voices really front and centre of the inquiry. And I think you know it's, it's great that you know, Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland is getting the privilege of putting that voice forward. But, but being able to bring people with long COVID to the committee, you did that last week, which was... The... I'm afraid well, I've run out of my 10 oh, minutes, sorry. so I'm afraid I'm going to have to draw that bit to a halt. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to move to Brian. I'm, I'm conscious of time that we're meant to finish at 10 past. I'm going to suggest that we be uh, extended to 20 past, if that's all right, with witnesses as well. Brian. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning uh, to the panel. I've been obviously listening with great interest uh, to what you're saying. And, and what it seems to, to me, I'm, I've got a big uh, beef around how we collect and, and utilise health data. Uh, and, and how we deploy that on an IT system that's that's 
not fit for purpose. And I think I, I used to say that long before long COVID arrived. And worries me that we have a, an NHS system that is under great pressure. It was under pressure before COVID. It's under greater pressure now. Um, there is a, a, across the country, there's a, a access to a, a health services varies greatly. If that's the case, how do we? How can we be sure that the data that we're gathering actually reflects what's really happening uh, in the system? If you can't see a GP or you can't get to secondary services or the GP can't uh, find a, a, a way to refer, how can we be sure that the data we're collecting around COVID and therefore how we treat COVID uh, is accurate? I'll, I'll come to you first, Jane Clare. I think the first thing to say is that the ONS data is, is widely accepted as being um, you know, solid and, and being able to be used to help us design services and, and to look at what um, long COVID is and how it should be dealt with within the NHS. Um, so we, we do have data and I think you know, our clinical colleagues would come in to say that it, it's not necessarily a lack of data to help us design services just now. Uh, I, I believe that we could be doing that right now. I think you have an absolute point around the use of data <coughs> as it's coming into the NHS and who gets to see it and share it. Um, so we know that there's a coding issue um, at GP primary care practice level. Um, that's something that we've argued for over two and a half years to get sorted. Um, I don't believe that GPs will find it easy to find the long COVID code, mainly because it's not called long COVID, despite the fact that's what people call it on a daily basis. Um, and, and so then using that data to create actions is, is going to be really difficult. There's also a major issue, I think, with the, the fact that in terms of the referral situation, you know, we certainly suffer from that as an organisation. Um, in order to be able to uh, receive referrals from the NHS, we currently have to go to each of the 14 health boards and fill out a 40-page form. So that's 560 pages that we have to deal with as a third sector organisation to navigate that. Uh, that means that you know, getting access to that data and that usage is, is really challenging um, for us. Um, we have been told over many years before uh, COVID came along that there was going to be a national solution to this. This was being sorted um, and that has not transpired. Um, it's certainly not transpired for long COVID or, or the other conditions that we work with. Um, and that's hugely disappointing because I think, as Amy has said, this was a real chance to solve that and to sort it. Um, I, I, we don't entirely understand why that, that hasn't happened. Um, I think there's, there's an element of people saying we need to wait for data to understand what's happening. But I think our clinical colleagues have shown us this morning there's plenty of evidence and data we can use to design services. Data is great, but it's what you do with it that really counts. And, and getting, getting that in place in the NHS is, is really important internally. Thank you. If I could come to you, uh, Dr Shackles, and broaden it out a little bit from a GP perspective. We talk about, I mean, when I was in the Health and Sport Committee, all of the last term, nearly everybody came in and said, we need our GPs to learn about this condition, or about this condition, we need education in this condition. And, and, and to me, long COVID was just added to a list of things we were asking our GPs uh, to learn about. And you alluded to the fact that um, at the moment that, that learning time is... is uh, not being not 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 being uh, given to to our GPs just now. So again, uh, if that's because we've, I, you know, I, I'll take issue with with uh, the, the, the committee with Eugene around the committee not taking evidence from uh, from long COVID sufferers because I think we have done that. I think there's a very consistent message coming out around a lot of long COVID sufferers have have, have had to pay privately because they couldn't access NHS. Uh, services uh, to get a, a, a diagnosis of long COVID. So if I, uh, so if I ask you, uh, 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 Dr Shackles, around this gathering of data, how can your members gather the data uh, if, first and foremost, they are uh, struggling to access the education that would, that would allow them to, to, to make this kind of, kind of diagnosis? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I agree. I think we have issues with the data collection within general practice. Uh, and that disappoints me to say that. Mm. Um, and the committee may well be aware that previously we had a system, the quality and outcomes framework, where we would code conditions and develop disease registers. And I think we were very good at that in general practice. Mm. Um, and we had um, some quite advanced systems to be able to do that and, and, and look at the data. Uh, that stopped with a new contract some years ago. Um, but unfortunately then, as the pandemic intervened, uh, we have not developed newer systems to look at our coding uh, and to make it uh, effective and efficient. Uh, I agree with what you say about the, uh, the computer systems that we have in general practice being not fit for purpose. Um, in my practice, we've just migrated over to the new hosted solution. That is better in that it's much faster. It's actually now usable. But uh, a lot of other things like the finding the coding or the ability to, to, um, to, to input data uh, is not much better yet. 
Um, myself and Chris Williams were invited by uh, Gregor Smith to write a joint letter uh, early in, in March 21 about coding, encouraging GPs to do that. I think the problem is with that is that there was a, a, a lot of other issues going on at that time with vaccination, and I think the letter and the information about coding was probably lost in that noise. And I think we probably can do more work to try and encourage his GP, G, GPs around the coding. But I would absolutely agree with Jane Clare that we have plenty of other evidence around long COVID. Um, we shouldn't just rely on this GP evidence. It will be useful to looking at how we manage in general practice, but it's not um, the, the evidence that we might have from general practice isn't going to be absolutely essential in, in looking at designing services. You know, we've got enough, you know, we absolutely believe, you know, this is a real condition. It's a, a, it's a big issue for that. And that's why as GPs, we need to know about it. I mean, for many of us as GPs, this COVID pandemic will define our careers, both with the acute and the fallout from it. Uh, the fallout being in, in uh, you know, other diseases and the, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, excess deaths as well. So it's a big thing. We need to, we need to take it on board and we need to, to be able to learn about it in all its manifestations. But we need time and we need resources to be able to do that. And at the moment, we are not seeing that in general practice. Funding has been withdrawn from general practice uh, over the last year. Uh, and that, that's not good enough. Thank you. Uh, if I just finally expand it out a little bit further uh, with, with, with Dr. Taylor around this, um, the idea that I mean, Dr. Taylor, you have, you have uh, gathered uh, data and information uh, from from around the world, um, and, and it kind of concerns me that, that uh, you've you've had you've had the ability to do that. You've personally taken that upon yourself to do that. Do we have an NHS system that has the ability to share? data across health boards, let alone gather data from around the world, which I think, you know, interesting enough, I read an article in, in uh, Australia um, who are doing, have exactly the same problem as we do, is, is this idea that we, we're not sharing data enough. So what's the solution, uh, Dr Taylor? Uh, so, yeah, I don't think there is sharing of data across the board, although everyone feeds into the government, as far as I can work out. Um, I would be happy to work with the Scottish Government to try and sort this out. Having run a clinic single-handedly myself, set it up from scratch to try and fix these problems. Um, with the issue of coding, just very quickly, as somebody with a, a vested interest in uh, long code, I couldn't find the codes, right? <laughs> um, I had to go away and find the actual code that you type in, the letters and the numbers. So if you were going to put in a heart attack into the coding for GPs, you would type in myocardial and up would come infarction, right? Easy. If you try to put in, you can't put in long COVID, if you try to put in post-COVID, you get about 100 COVID codes with like PCR tests and whatnot. That's easily fixed. Somebody that knows about computers can go in and sort that so that if you type in long COVID comes up and that would sort out the coding. I think, I think people are getting diagnosed. I, I don't see an issue with... GPs not diagnosing people on the whole. I think they're getting a diagnosis, but I think they're having to be ruling out other things first, which is natural with these sort of conditions. You've you got to make sure somebody's not got lung cancer, you know, hiding behind the lung COVID. Um, but then past that, yes, we aren't counting. And, you know, five to ten, we know that five to 10% of people get lung COVID, right? So we can work out from that what we think we should be expecting. The ONS survey is pretty good. Um, generally at, at picking up uh, who's having symptoms. It doesn't quite tell you who's got long COVID. It will tell you who's, who, who is self-reporting symptoms. Um, and and it's, it's pretty sensitive. But for Scotland as a, as a country, rather than the, the UK as a whole, I think there could be more work done, done on that. And I think it has to be a coordinated approach um, centrally. Um, and... Um, put it all together, work out what the need is. But you're going to be looking at five to ten percent of the population. And it's the same across the world. It doesn't, you know, that there will be people who are more vulnerable to long COVID genetically or for other factors. But on the whole, that's what you're looking at. And it doesn't seem to be going down. Um, I think it was NHS Lanarkshire's submission I looked at where they said they expected a bell shaped curve with referrals, but they haven't seen that. They've just they're just constant. So I think putting all the data together centrally, but if it, you know, I I've, I haven't done any work with the Scottish government. I've been on my own. I have taken on. I, I had no idea when I did this. Um, I thought it would be an, you know, like any other service. Some people might want to 
come and come and see a doctor and spend a bit longer. I had no idea that I would be it. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. I'm going to move on to Jim Fairley, please. Thanks. Uh, Amy, I understand that you wanted to respond to Brian Whittle. Do you want to do that quickly before I come into my questions? Thank you. I'll make it quick. In England, the various long COVID clinics are working in networks to share education and learning. So Claire's learnt lots and lots about this, but she's got no one to share it with because there are no networks across Scotland to share that information that she's learnt about how to use common medications in an unconventional way, but in a totally safe way to treat the sequelae of long COVID. But I think just to, just to add that in, if we have these long COVID clinics and networks, we learn from each other and we can improve our treatment and management of patients with it. OK, thank you. Um, Dr Shackers, can I come to you first? The, I mean, a lot of talk about the, the workforce pressures. What, what impact do the workforce pressures have on establishing and actually delivering the services that people need with long COVID? Mm -hmm. And what action could be taken to assist NHS boards to fill the specific posts that are required to deal with long COVID? That's a really difficult question. Um, uh, within our own workforce, it's about uh, retaining people in the jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and as has been said before, it's because a lot of people are feeling burnt out by the uh, pressures of acute COVID and then the uh, secondary work, uh, workload from uh, remobilisation and other conditions. So some sort of um, thoughts about that, about we ha how we help people to manage and how we help the workforce well-being as well and putting... Uh, Putting, putting that front and centre as well. So I think that would be important. Um, I think as well, if we're looking at particularly around uh, the long COVID workforce, is actually making sure that it is, it is not stigmatised. Um, there is that, it's seen as being, you're being put into a silo of long COVID mm -hmm. um, and actually it is not necessarily valued. And I think we may have to change that messaging as well, that it is important, that it is valuable and not just an afterthought. I'm, I'm kind of curious about some of the evidence I've heard today. Um, right at the start, you said you're not being inundated with, or your members are not being inundated with people presenting with long COVID. And I think it was Anna who Anna said um, that's because people have stopped coming because they're not being listened to. Jane Clare is saying, we want to be inundated. You are inundated. Why is that? Is it because Jane Clare's organisation is third sector? Did the NHS not work closely with this third sector organisation? We know that we've got a huge problem. We can clearly hear that. Why is this not being coordinated better? Is it because GPs are under so much pressure? Are you not getting the time to think about how do we do this differently? Absolutely, we do not have time to think. We are inundated with lots of things. Lots of things, lots of other conditions of people coming up. You know, this, this, this story that was going around that general practice was closed was a false narrative, I'm afraid. Uh, we have been open right the way through, both for face-to-face -face and uh, remote consultations. Um, our members report that you know, make it, they have never been busier. The spike of activity pre-Christmas was unprecedented. Um, so there's lots of people resenting, but exactly as you say, we're not getting time to think and to think how to do things better. Uh, and that's what we need to be able to do, how we can integrate, how we can interface with secondary care uh, and third sector and the care, uh, the care sector as well. Do we need... Before I come back to you, Claire Taylor just says she wants to intervene here. She may have the answer before I ask it. Claire, can you want, do you want to come in just now, please? Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to agree with David um, that um, general practice has never been so busy, absolutely inundated. GPs of 10 minutes, patients have got more and more complicated problems that that have built up or, or that um, have developed due to COVID. And I don't think this is a, a GP, fully GP manageable condition, even though I am a GP. I, I think to put that onto GPs is too much because you wouldn't expect a GP to fully manage rheumatoid arthritis. You would expect that they would have the right pathway, they would support their patients, they would know how to suspect it what tests to do to refer on, and then there would be ongoing between secondary and primary care. And I, and I think that... I'll interrupt you there for a wee second, Claire, because I'm very short of yeah, time. Sure. I'll interrupt you. Sure. I'm going to go back to the question I was going to come to you with, uh, Dr Shackles. Does this need somebody else 
who's not in the front line on a day-to-day -day basis coming in and having a look at what you're dealing with and saying, how do we manage this better? I don't know if I can answer that question. Um. Well, well I'm, I'm trying to, to, to... The purpose of this is to find solutions to what is yeah. clearly a problem. Yeah. So how do we sort the problem? The problem is people have got long COVID. The fact that it's been diagnosed and, and given a name by patients, would it help if it was the, the, the medical practice who said, no, we're going to rename it and start again? Because we're, we're also hearing today that some medical practitioners don't recognise it. And I don't understand why... There is so much of this disinformation that's fragmented and it's not working. So does there need to be someone else who comes in and says, OK, this is a national problem. These guys are trying to deal with everything else that's going on the front line. How do we help to solve this problem? Yeah. I mean, I think that one of the key things is, and it's one of the things that I think Amy had uh, mentioned earlier, is actually looking at what's been working in other areas. If networks work very well, look at that. Let's look at what the gold standard is from some, somewhere else about say, rather than just trying to, to dream something up out of the blue for us. I think we do, we do have to, to look wider for that okay. and to make sure we get things on. What we need as GPs is, is the evidence at our fingertips about what, what works. And the, the sign nice and RCGP guideline is good. That needs to be a living guideline that's updated to tell us what to do when. That, that's really important. For that, uh, uh, for that, but I think looking at what's worked from other clinics, other other networks, other countries even is is probably sensible rather than completely reinventing it. I think we've we've got to listen to our patients. I think just calling it uh, something else just because we decide it isn't going to work. Let's listen to our patients. You, let's l use the language our patients are using because okay. uh, that's important. Okay, thank you very much, Jane Clare. To say is we've got a model in Scotland in Lothian that is an integrated model for long COVID and we just need to embrace a model and, and get on with that work. The second thing that I would say is, is that we've been waiting on a national clinical lead. Um, uh, the recruitment exercise apparently finished in August last year, but we still don't understand who that person is and, and when they're going to start. So we could have someone nationally um, coordinating on that. Um, and, and the final point is around the referral process. Signposting to the to the third sector is, is is not that effective. It needs to be integrated into the system, and that's how we built our service was to work in partnership with the NHS. I don't believe the NHS doesn't want to work with the third sector. I just don't think we're enabling um, that to happen. Um, I, I've got one extra point to make because I don't think it's fair to leave it hanging. Mm -hmm. In terms of community of the committee engagement with people with long COVID, I, I take the points that you're making. We did feedback um, to the clerking team about our views on that, and an extension was granted to the consultation process for written um, submissions. We are happy to work with the committee on those issues, but, but I, if I get that feedback from people with long COVID, I will um, put that forward to the committee and, and make the offer to help with you on that. Okay, thank you. Lorraine, sorry, would you I'm like sorry, to come um, Mr. Valley, sorry, we're 20 past, so I'm going to have to stop that. Okay. There. And apologies that we have run over today. I'd like to thank the witnesses for their evidence and for giving us your time this morning. If witnesses would like to raise any further evidence with the committee, they can do so in writing with the clerks. We'll be happy to liaise with you about how to do this. I will now briefly suspend the meeting to allow a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
We will now continue to take evidence on the long COVID inquiry, and I'd like to welcome our second panel to the meeting, Julie Thompson, Director of Training for Psychology Services, and Professor Lindsay Donaldson, Deputy Medical Director, both of who join us from NHS Education for Scotland. Linda Curry, Associate H. A, sorry, AHP Director of NHS Highland, and Heather Cameron, Director of Allied Health Professions, NHS Lothian. Janice Heaney, Associate Director of National Strategic Networks, National Specialists and Screening Services Directorate at NHS National Services Scotland, who joins us online. And Manira Ahmad, Chief Officer of Public Health Scotland. Thank you, everybody, for giving us your time this morning. We estimate this session will run up to about quarter past 11, so I'm sorry, going to add an extra 10 minutes on, so it'll be about 25 past 11, and each member will have approximately 10 minutes to speak to the panel to ask their questions. I'm keen to ensure that everybody gets an opportunity to speak, so I apologise in advance, therefore, if time runs on too much, I may have to interrupt members or witnesses just in the interest of brevity. For Janice, who joins us online this morning, if you would like to respond to an issue being discussed, please just put R in the chat box and we'll bring you in. Can I invite witnesses to briefly introduce themselves? And can I start with you, Janice? Yeah, I am Associate Director of National Strategic Networks in NHS National Service Scotland and the Long COVID Strategic Network sits within my remit. Thank you very much. And start with Minira. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me along. My name is Munir Ahmed. I'm the Chief Officer of Public Health Scotland, also the Chair of the Long COVID Strategic Network. Thank you, Kavina. Thank you. Heather? Good morning. I'm Heather Cameron. I'm Director of Allied Health Professions at NHS Lothian. I'm a physiotherapist by background and I co-led um, some of the work within NHS Lothian around Long COVID. Thank you. Linda? Hi, Linda Curry. I'm the Associate Allied Health Professions Director for NHS Highland um, and I'm our clinical lead for long COVID in the board. Thank you. Judy? Hello there, good morning. My name is Judy Thompson and I'm the Director of Training for Psychology Services at NHS Education for Scotland, where I also have a broader corporate leadership role in mental health and I'm a clinical psychologist by training. Thank you. And Lindsay? Good morning. Uh, my name is Lindsay Donaldson. I'm Deputy Medical Director of NHS Education for Scotland. My clinical background is intensive care, and NESS is the statutory education body and training body for health and social care in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. I'm going to move to questions, and I'm going to move straight to Alex Rowley. Thank you, and, and good morning. I think most people were here for the last session as well, so, so it probably follows on good now that that we've actually got you here, because one of the issues there seem to be that there, there is differences. I think one person talked about NHS Lothian having a good model, whatever. So could I ask, what are the key enablers and the key barriers to setting up services specifically for uh, people suffering from, from long COVID? Or I think, as one witness said there, perhaps that's not how you'd want to do it, because a lot of people report with similar symptoms. So, but what are the, the enablers and barriers to, to start to get services in place that are joined up and, 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 and personal driven? And uh, we'll just start with, get better get the names right this time. Uh, let's start with Professor Lindsay Donaldson. Th thanks very much indeed. And I think many of the enablers sit with education and training and learning. And I think the, the iterative process of learning as we hear from with the lived experience, as we learn as a profession and as we learn as a multidisciplinary team. So I think one of the key enablers is, is, is learning and education. And it will take some time. We know some things. We don't know everything. We will keep learning. OK, thank you. And, and can I just go along and ask you the next? Yes, I agree with my, with my colleague that learning and education is a key enabler. Um, in terms of how we make this work in Scotland, we do need to be mindful of the different geography and um, uh, the social composition of the populations across Scotland and take account of that in, in terms of both how we disseminate learning but also how uh, services are constructed and how the networks can work together. So. I don't think there's one solution in Scotland that will work everywhere. Um, uh, we need to be responsive to local need and what's going on in, already in local services, both in terms of clinical delivery and education. 
Uh, yeah, to add to that, really, we are seeing multidisciplinary teams coming into uh, into play and, and working very closely with third sector colleagues. Um, so in Highland, we're working closely with the third sector group called Let's Get On With It Together. And we're thinking about you know, joint groups and things like that. So it's just getting the tiered level of support, right? Yeah, good. And Heather? Um, so I'm going to start with the barriers, um, or keep focused on some of the barriers. I think, for me, one of the overarching barriers around delivering services for people with long COVID is, is still our understanding of what we mean by long COVID. And we've heard quite a robust debate this morning, and you'll have heard, I know you've heard from a number of witnesses. And long COVID effectively is an, an overarching term that we are using for a, a, a very broad range of symptoms, and some of the literature su suggesting up to 200. Um, obviously, we know there's probably a core five or six that, that is there. So it, it, in terms of actually, we, we've put an awful lot of things into one pot to try and say, right, let's come up with a solution to manage this incredibly complex um, position, which is why, from an NHS Lothian perspective, what we have done is try to take our learning, and I think this is an enabler, from the management of other long-term conditions. So this is a long-term condition. There is some knowns around the pathologies, but there are still some unknowns. We know in common with um, a number of long-term conditions that there isn't always a direct, direct relationship between the severity of the disease and the severity of the symptoms that people are then left with. So we're focusing on, from a symptom management perspective, that actually are, we're being reactive and responsive to what people are telling us they are presenting with. And rather than trying to label everything from a long COVID perspective, we are actually being driven in a long-term conditions model, which is very much about if you can manage something medically, if there's a medical target, we should be investigating and managing that. If there isn't, we should be focusing on the symptoms, how people are presenting, and then therefore um, actually giving them the support through a rehabilitative approach, both through the NHS, but then through our third sector partners. And you've obviously heard from Chester and Stroke this morning. So we, we've turned that barrier, I guess, hopefully into an enabler. Thank you, Marina. You... Yeah, no, thank you very much. My colleagues have made my job easier, so my update will be short. I guess one of the things for me, which my colleagues started to kind of lean in towards, is the amount of evidence and the evidence-led decision-making. I think one of the positives from our network, our long COVID agent network, has been able to bring groups of people together from local systems um, and use that knowledge and to do a Once for Scotland approach. So one of our subgroups are the service planners, and I know previously some of the witnesses have talked about how do we how do we plan, how do we bring the right services, um, and how do we make sure that the private, the, the sorry, the primary, the acute, the, the voluntary sector, third sector, all kind of working together. And I think we have an opportunity with the service planning group to support them through evidence-led change using some of what we already have around ONS we mentioned we've got the relative burden for the burden of disease and we've got data coming hopefully in the coming months from Eve 2 as well how we can use those insights make them digestible and translatable and based on what my colleague says using that lived experience as well to help service planners plan and local systems using that multidisciplinary approach that is happening I agree so we've got learning to share on that so I think that's a massive enabler for us but the other one is that once we do get more robust data coming in over the coming months and I'm happy to share that convener with the committee once it's available and ready that we can use that to help those service planners really bring together the different multi-agency approach across the different sectors thank okay. you thank you and is it Janice it's online yeah yes. yeah Janice Thank you. Yeah, as uh, as Marina said, the, the, the network has uh, brought together service planners from across the NHS boards. Um, we've established peer uh, support forums that enables those service planners and people uh, working with those with long COVID to come together to share best practice. And I think that's one of the key enablers is allowing that sharing of learning and best practice across the NHS uh, in Scotland to enable that uh, discussion and 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 work looking at what's working and what can be taken back into uh, into health boards. Um, and in the future, we'll be establishing multidisciplinary team sessions, as has already been previously mentioned. Uh, again, to look at those complex cases and look at again what's worked, uh, what can we take from that in terms of best practice. So I, I agree with my colleagues that the 
the, the key enablers are around that sharing of best practice and uh, education and learning uh, for those delivering services. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Brenda Fraser. Thank you, Convener. Good morning uh, to all, all the panel. Um, I want to ask around the question of uh, pathways for long COVID sufferers. The committee previously took some evidence from um, long COVID sufferers who expressed their concern that either the pathways didn't exist or if they existed were not, were not working. And you may have seen in the previous uh, evidence session this morning, um, we heard from um, Jane Clare Judson, who said um, Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland, who do have assistance available, um, they, she said they would love to be overwhelmed with patients coming forward, but they weren't receiving them because of a lack of signposting. And we also heard, I think it's from Amy Small, uh, that you know, she felt that these networks didn't exist in Scotland and we didn't have long COVID clinics as existed uh, south of the border. So I suppose my question is, do you accept there is an issue with uh, pathways either not existing or not operating properly? And what can be done to try and, and fix this? I don't know who wants to kick off. Manira Ahmed, you're, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, and, and it's a very big question, so I'm sure my colleagues will come in and, and, sure. and say bits on that. But if I can take some elements off, if that's OK. What we're learning and what I'm finding, what colleagues around uh, from the um, Long Covid Strategic Network are finding, actually, that we cannot have a single practice deployed across Scotland. <laughs> different things are happening in different elements. The, uh, and then we have what we have is we've got the funding to be able to support services, support the resources in, into areas. But then it's that challenge of being able to recruit in a timely manner and how re reoccurring that is. And that has been worked through with sponsors, with government um, and with colleagues at the network. I guess your question around do pathways exist, they clearly do exist from hearing from colleagues beforehand um, in the previous committee, they do exist. I think the opportunity that we can galvanise on is that how can we mimic that for others that are not getting the services or the pathways. So there is an opportunity, though a challenge, there is an opportunity to be able to do that. The other piece, before I hand over to other colleagues, um, as they might want to say more, um, the other piece for me um, in and around this is also the, the lack of information that we do have right now. So we do have, as I say, the ONS data, but we are reliant on people self-referring or understanding that they have long COVID. And with the EVE 2 study coming, that data should give us enough more robust evidence to be able to then target in on areas, on people and populations where we do need to be developing the pathways. But I think one of the things to think about right now for us all is that we are still in the challenge of recovery. So we're coming of a pandemic. There's system pressures across the entire system. So we do have an opportunity to work better in amongst all of that, but we also do need to be cognizant that within the burden, the relative burden, the long COVID, there's lots of other symptoms that boards, local systems are grappling with. Um, so again, another opportunity, how do we make that sustainable um, and even use the learning from long COVID to, to, to spread across the other, the other pathways? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else want to come in? Heather Cameron. Yeah. Happy to come in. Um, so yeah, I would agree there are clearly pathways. Um, some are arguably would be more robust than others. I think when there is a very clear um, uh, medical or symptomatic presentation, then um, some of those clinical pathways are perhaps a little bit more robust than, than when people have um, perhaps a less medically targetable presentation, for example, chronic fatigue, brain fog. We know that that's a significant issue, but there isn't a single profession or clinical specialty that owns that. So what we're doing, um, you heard um, Dr Shekels mentioned the Ref Help within Lothian, and, and we know that that is widely um, held up and well regarded. It is a clear source of information for GPs. We currently have got some information around our long COVID um, offer within RevHelp, but we have a clinical reference group that at the moment have been working through what is the demand, where are we hearing from people around that additional need, what challenges are our, our patients telling us. We have a patient reference group actually ongoing right at this very minute. We've got another two planned so that we can actually look at the information on RefHelp to make it clearer for um, GPs and others to make that, that pathway. So, yes, there are pathways. Do I accept there are some challenges? It's not perfect, but 
Um, we're definitely working on it, and we've made great strides already, but, but more to come. OK, thank you. Um, Janice Heaney, I think, wants to come in, please. Yes, thank you. So just, just to build on, on Heather's point, we, as part of the network, have uh, a lived experience network, uh, which sits alongside our strategic network, and, and that's really critical for us to get that voice of lived experience into the work that we're doing. Um, so we are involving lived experience representatives in a number of the working groups of the network. Um, some of that will be looking at, at the children and young people work stream. Some of that will be looking at pathways. So I just wanted to, to bring in that point that we are, as a network, really um, committed and, and absolutely committed to ensuring that we've got that lived experience representation and voice um, to, so that we can understand the experience of, of accessing those pathways. Okay, thank you. Judy Thompson. Yeah. Yes, I just wanted to make the point that there's um, an issue around retention and recruitment. Uh, as you are aware, that some additional funding has been made available to the health boards across Scotland. But in common with our, our contacts we have with NES across the system, we, we are aware that it's quite difficult to attract people to um, temporary posts. And quite a lot that the funding has been provided on a temporary basis, and it is therefore quite difficult to make those posts attractive enough to uh, get the specialists um, from EHPs and other disciplines um, into the posts. Um, so I think that is a significant issue, which has an impact on how effective the pathways that have been set up can be. And I think that comes through in the submissions that have been made from a number of our health boards. Sure, thank you. I think, I think that one of my colleagues will be asking about workforce shortly. Professor Donaldson. Yeah. Thank you very much, and, and, and thank you to my colleagues. And I think this is our role in our, in our role of training the health and social care workforce, accepting their inconsistencies. And actually, there, there may well be real reasons for differences in how health boards deliver. But NES, as a multidisciplinary team enabler, I think has a role and will look forward to working with these networks around the education of the entire team and, and um, delivering that in perhaps different models. I think that's something that NES are looking at, how we deliver health care and, and social care. And the multidisciplinary team is key. Thank you. OK, thanks. Can I just ask one follow-up question to Janice Heaney, if I can? And that's about whether there are plans to develop standardised guidance for use across all NHS boards in Scotland? And if so, <coughs> when is that likely to be in place? So I, I guess that will develop as the network develops. Um, there is a um, NICE guideline, which is a, a living document, which is a standard clinical guidance in this area. Um, so that, that is the key guidance document that will be used. But as we develop the network and as we work with the subject matter experts and with the service planners, um, then we they, then we may look to develop further uh, further guidance um, for specific pathways if that if that becomes clear that that's a, that there's a need for that. But the, the main document is the is the nice guidance um, that's the clinical guidance in this area. Okay, thank you. I'm conscious Linda Curry didn't let you in. Do you want to say, come in? Just yeah. very quickly, um, I definitely think there's more we could be doing around communication of mm -hmm. the pathways as they're being established. I think we just also need to recognise that our teams are on our, our or the clinicians are new in post and have to really be given time to develop their own expertise. Um, there is an expectation that once post holders come into post and the pathway is set up, that there's an expert team. And the difficulty is those clinicians have come with wide and varied backgrounds, but they do need to be given the time to establish their own skills um, and, and pick up on all of the research and things that are out there. I think the other thing we, we've, we've been developing more recently that's helped is a multidisciplinary triage meeting um, where we do have one of our secondary care respiratory consultants in helping us to guide our patients or our primary care colleagues through the different clinical pathways and that, that's been really useful. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to cover, if I may, uh, long COVID in kids and the committee has met, uh, we had an informal session with family members of um, children that were suffering from long COVID and some of these children hadn't been to school in years, and it was quite a harrowing session um, for us all to hear this, their stories. And they, they felt that there was a lack of support and diagnosis for children that were suffering from low, long COVID. So I'd like to ask the panel, is there sufficient knowledge and understanding among health professionals around long COVID in children, and does it impact on diagnosis of long COVID in children? 
I'm not sure if anybody would like to. Minera, did you want to come in? Well, I'm going to defer that to some of my more clinical, medically trained colleagues, if that's OK. But I might come back after sure. that. Is that okay. OK, convener? Thank you. Linda. Um, from an NHS Highland point of view, our, as you can imagine, uh, some of our teams are very small and integrated. We work very closely with our um, children and young people colleagues. Um, we're not seeing a huge amount of referrals coming through that service, but we would be trying to, and we've done this with other areas of work like major trauma, where we use the staff that have come into the long COVID funded posts to support the uh, children's clinicians, because that, you, you almost need both skill sets. Mm. Um, so certainly children that are being referred will be seen alongside, you know, other children within the services. Thank you, Linda. Does, uh, yes, Heather. Um, Similarly, we um, within Lothian, we're not seeing a massive increase in demand when we speak to our clinicians. We have taken a similar approach with children's that we're taking with adults, which is that to embed the management according to the presentation. We have got a number of teams who have got um, significant skills in managing long-term conditions. And so um, depending on what is the key initial presentation is that, that that's where the, the children or young person would initially get their support and then they would work across the teams if there was uh, multiple pathologies that were presenting. But the, the data on the ground, and I guess I would put that caveat, we've, I, I heard some of the debate about data earlier and it remains a significant challenge. Um, but the, the information that we have got is that we're not seeing significant numbers and the the ones that we are seeing are, are being managed within this, the services that we currently have. So we haven't set up anything specifically separate, but as part of our um, work that we've been doing in scoping and looking at pathways, then we will obviously be looking at, at children's services as well. Thank you, Heather. Janice, did you want to come in on this? Um, I can do, yes. In terms of the, again, in terms of the, the National Strategic Network, one of the work streams that we're just establishing now is a children and young person work stream. So we'll be focusing on that on the coming uh, on the coming weeks and months. And again, we'll have um, lived experience representation um, on that group to ensure that we're capturing everything um, that's, that's coming through. Um, but, but colleagues are are, uh, are better able to answer from a clinical perspective. But from a network perspective, we'll definitely um, be focusing on that children and young people work stream. So just hopefully that's reassuring for the uh, for the committee. Thank you, Thank you Janice. Uh, I was going to ask Munira, I don't, I'm not sure if this is a quick question for you. What support do children with long COVID have when they're tra transitioning into adult services? So if they're caught long COVID, say when they were 15 and as they're coming mm. up to 18, how mm. do they transition into adult services? Is, is there support out there for them? So, so Kavina, thank you. And, and, um, a very pertinent question, not one that I have the answer to okay. at hand right now, but there is another point that kind of related, if that's mm -hmm. okay, Kavina, if I can come sure. into this. So Public Health Scotland, the more wider basis, is doing a lot of work around children and young people. And what we've now started to focus more and more on is how we help that multidisciplinary team function and really getting it right in early years. So working with schools, working with nurseries, working with the wider system within the local and regional space. And part of, um, and not specifically around long COVID, but actually to identify where support is needed, not just for the, the child or the young person, but for the family as well. So one of the examples is that we're supporting the build of a new, uh, through a public health approach, a new high school in Liberton. So what does a public health approach mean? And that's not just about the education, but it's about the wider social determinants, about health, care, and the need for the, the, the young people, but also the families as well. And I'm hoping, convener, by having those conversations, bringing a wider public health approach to building services, that we will start to influence how resources planned at a local level, where the focus should be for communities as well. And we'll start to unearth, and as my colleague was saying, that we are still waiting for um, a better understanding. And with the network setting up a children and um, young people's um, subgroup, we will learn more and start to filter that in through various guises that all our organisations have reached into. Um, thank you very much, Convener. Thank you. I'm going to move on to Brian Whittle now. Please. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Really interesting uh, this session. Th those who are there you know, this morning will, will know that, that I have a, 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 an interest around uh, a, a, a health data and how we, because we're actually very good at collecting data, funny enough, we're not very good at deploying the data. And I'm 
I'm going to um, speak to a point you made um, right at the start, uh, Heather, around the, you know the, the, the number of symptoms that are involved and can be involved in um, diagnosis of long COVID. And I was just looking here. Was, um, you know, if you if you if you if you get to a GP and they have to refer, they can refer you know, for chest pain to an ECG. They can refer you know for abdominal pain to an MRI scan. They can you know blood test for fatigue and brain fog. And without question, within uh, something like long COVID, you're going to have a mental health element to that. I'd be interested to hear what you have to say with that, um, uh, uh, Ms. Thompson. But it kind of speaks to this, um, to, and that get, that's to get to a long COVID uh, diagnosis, which is really a, a condition really of an elimination, as far as I, I, I can see. So it's really resource intensive that we're putting onto a system that's already under pressure. And what we heard uh, quite a lot from um, uh, those with long COVID is, is it ended, they ended up with uh, having to go privately to get that kind of that, that, to get that diagnosis. And then we've heard this morning around the GPs, the, the pressure on their time uh, and their ability to learn, uh, capacity to learn uh, and share learning and that experience. So that's a long-winded way of me getting back to: uh, uh, Do we have a data system and an IT system? that's fit for purpose, that allows input and uh, output uh, from our, for our NHS professionals um, and and even integration with the third sector in that. I mean, I've, I've been long been on this. I, I don't think we do, but I'd, I'd, be, I'd be interested to hear, uh, you know, as a, as a long-term solution, is that the direction of travel we should be going? I'll come to you first, Heather. Um. So, so there's a short answer to that, that question, I guess, which is, 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 it, is it fit for purpose in terms of giving us the overall picture across primary care, secondary care, specialist services? And the answer is no at the moment. We, we, we know that different health boards even have different services. So if you happen to move across different health boards, then um, you know, the information is not always easily shareable. We have come a long way, I think, within the health board <laughs> side of it. Um, our GP systems, people who work in acute hospitals don't have access to that, mm -hmm. but we have been able to give some primary care colleagues better access. So I, I think we've definitely moved on. There is no question that information sharing is far superior than it would have been maybe 20, 10, 20 years ago, but there are still gaps. And there's something around how we set up. The information we get out is only as good as the information that we put in, and therefore it's only as good as how the question that we ask. So if the question is about numbers, we're pretty good at counting numbers. If the question is about a complex diagnosis, then as you heard from colleagues earlier, the coding, if the coding, if you've got a selection of 20 codes and you've got two minutes to, or one minute to make that decision, then people will pick a quick code. So um, the systems, there's the aspect of talking to each other, I guess, but there is also about the systems need to be designed to answer the questions that, that you're all interested in asking. The systems that we have tend to be designed to answer um, numbers rather than qualitative information. Yeah, it's okay. I think I've met my match on passion for data here. <laughs> um, so if I can share a few things from Public Health Scotland as colleagues around this table and yourselves will be aware that we are very much evidence-led organisation. And um, so some of the things that hopefully will start to answer some of those questions, I'm not saying it will completely um, revolutionise everything, but I think that's where we're headed towards. Um, so from, from a national perspective, Public Health Scotland clearly understands change happens within local systems. And because of that, you know, we have local analytical teams spread across Scotland, working with health and social care partnerships, local authorities, third and voluntary sectors, to give them access to that joined up data. Nationally, we collect what we haven't got, where the gaps are in the local system, and join that to our national holdings. We're also developing what's called the whole systems modelling. And Kavina, again, I can share some of this um, if 
colleagues are interested. We have our whole systems modelling platform as well, which focuses on demand and need and how we can use or better utilise capacity within the system. And these are actually these um, the, this tool particularly has been used by board um, chief execs to understand where the pressure is and how we can really work at a regional and a national level around resource allocation. So there is a lot that's going on. I think one of the opportunities Public Health Scotland has now is making that data translatable and digestible by reaching into the local and regional systems and getting them to use that data um, in the strategic planning, but also the operational service delivery. Thank you. And um, hi, yeah, I just wanted to agree with what Heather was saying about integrated systems, but also an opportunity for us in Scotland is the, um, the procurement of the C19 YRS mm. app, which is the York Rehabilitation Scale, or it's based on the York Rehabilitation Scale. Um, and that app, a couple of us in health boards have already um, progressed with use of the app, but that is going through that national procurement process at the moment. Um, that app helps our patients. They self-assess themselves. They can go back and self-assess at regular periods. There's a suite of outcome measures on there. We, we can ask for any um, formal standardised outcome measures to go onto that system. Um, and then there is also a huge wealth of education resources on there that the patients can access direct. I think what, what is useful for us going on in a Once for Scotland approach is that we can develop the, you know, the data collection from that system in, a, in one uh, in a Once for Scotland way. So that, that's going to be really useful, whereas in, in England that's been done by each individual clinic or service. So I think that's going to provide a, a huge amount of research for us and evidence. Well, just, just I'll, come, I'll come to you, uh, uh, Ms. Thompson. I, I think, just to add, add to that, I think that the, the concern here is that if we can't, if you can't go across an NHS border and take your data with you, um, um, and, and, and a global pandemic where we've got a, we have global data, if we can't if we can't tra transfer data from one NHS uh, uh, system to another NHS system, how can we expect to to, to you know integrate? internationally uh, uh, to, to help us develop a, a strategy to tackle on COVID? Um, I, I agree with you that it's a significant issue and it's, um, it's not only an issue in relation to long COVID, yeah. it's a, a long-standing issue which applies across the whole mm -hmm. health system. Um, yeah. I'm afraid I don't really have any answers to that major challenge. I know the organisation that I work for, um, you know, we have um, a very significant a um, bit of our organisation is around digital and digital technology, um, but I don't claim to have any specific expertise in that issue, um, but could go back to colleagues and, and see if there's anything else they would like to say around this. Like what you're talking about there really it is, isn't about education and training and workforce development, is it? It's about clinical data that I think you're... Um, yeah, just, yeah, I think it's, it's this idea that, the, the, and I know I'm, I'm against, against the clock here, <laughs> but I think the, the idea is, is that, you know, the, the, if we look at the challenges, it's GPs want to know, GPs haven't got the time to know and haven't got access to, uh, to, to that information, and it's how we join those dots up, really, to make sure that the, the, the time they use is, is best. Is, is best. I, I know if they want to come back in. Very quickly, uh, I absolutely just needs more investment, but there is also the system being implemented called Care Portal, where we can mm -hmm. see different systems. Uh, clinicians can see the different um, assessments, letters, um, and that, that we are using that in the background, so that does pull quite a lot of that mm -hmm. clinical information together. Okay, I don't, I'll, I'll stop there. Um. Thank you. John Mason. Hey, thanks, Convener. I think probably my questions follow on because I want to look at the education side of things and just ask you a bit about uh, where that is. I mean, we, we at the previous session, we had a paper from Chest, Heart and Stroke which said that most GPs had heard of long COVID and, and that kind of jumped out at me that I was a bit worried if some GPs hadn't heard of long COVID. So, I mean, let, if we start with GPs, can you give us something of an explanation as to how are GPs educated or their skills are kept up to date and, and all that kind of thing on this kind of issue? Would you like me to start? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, would, would it be okay if I took them in two stages? Yes. Um, so, GP trainees. So, um, so, so obviously, NACE employs our GP trainees and there are training programmes and... There, so for our, tra our GP trainees, there are regular training days, for example, where they would all come together, either virtually or 
and the training days. So, for example, I know that the um, last year there was a training training day on long COVID. Um, then we have our GPs that are working, that are on the register, that are no longer in training. And so for the, the college um, put out a, a module, I, I suspect that's been discussed many times around long COVID with the, the sign guidelines. So I think one of the things that, that comes out um, around, you're, you're right about hearing about it, seeing a patient with long COVID may explain some of the inconsistencies because they may not see somebody if at, at this stage. The, the numbers of GPs, the numbers of long COVID patients that are presenting, that that's maybe where some of the inconsistencies comes. Mm -hmm. But again, just, just saying that the, the, the training is live and as we develop an evidence base, that training will continue. Yes. I mean, I, I think in your paper, it talks about the general practice, nursing, GPN, education pathway. Is that right? Yes. So is, is that the main way into a GP practice? It's not necessarily directly to the GP themselves, but it might be through the nurse. I think it's all through the MDT again. I think that's that's key with general practices working very much in a multidisciplinary way. And the more angles and ways we can get in to a practice in their learning and training, then that helps. Now, I, sh I should probably not make a confession here, but I'm an accountant and we're meant to do continuing professional development. Yeah. And let's say some of us do it more than others. Um, so <laughs> there can be a bit of inconsistency there. I mean, in the general terms, would that be true of GPs as well? I think our GMC Good Medical Practice is very clear about CPD in that we, as, as clinicians, we must keep up to date. So we do have guidance around that. OK, thanks. I mean, maybe I could switch on to some of the more the land-based, the regional health boards. Um, how do you see this picture, both of GPs and of other professionals, educating them about this? Um, well, if you think about the geographical area that NHS Highland covers and, and all of the different clinicians, that, that is a challenge. And there is also the priority when, when a clinical team come into the board of wanting to get on and see the patients and the capacity to also do that education widely across all of the multidisciplinary team. But we, we are doing that. Um, we, we meet with our GPs, GP leadership groups, um, I've met with them a number of times. We, we meet with our clinical teams. We've got the national clinical network that I chair, that NSS have set up. You know, they're, they're, it's, it's actually, you know, much more accessible now to do training. So it is happening, but I think, it, you know, it, it's just going to take us time to, to get to everyone, if you like. Um, and there are so many other pressures in the system, so it is difficult. I mean, in Lothian's case, I mean, we've had the good model of the, the kind of pilot, I think, with the chest heart and stroke, and I was at a separate seminar about that, which was very impressive. But, I mean, is, is it largely down to individual GPs or other medical professionals to, you know, if they really want to get into a subject like long COVID, it's largely up to them? Or does the health board, you know, try and push things more? So uh, there's a bit of both. Um, as you rightly said, every registered healthcare practitioner um, have um, uh, regulations around their CPD and they make declarations that they are maintaining their CPD. But there is a wide breadth about what, what people can, can um, engage with. Obviously, if something within the board or within primary care is prioritised, that will be pushed more. Um, but to some extent, yes, of course, there is um, elements of, of self-choice or self-interest. I think there are opportunities for us to look at other ways that we can support that learning. And some of that is we talked about pathways earlier and actually being really clear and having really clear guidance for us, that's Ref Help. We know that GPs go to Ref Help to look for information to support them. So it might not be that that's that formal learning, but actually that is that learning through that process. But the one other thing that I think I would say from an education perspective is that um, I think we also need to think about how we take the opportunities again to look at the knowledge and skills that people already have in learning long in, in managing long term conditions. So a number of the um, issues that people with long with long COVID are presenting with, we do see in other long term conditions, things like fatigue things like breathlessness, things like brain fog. And actually, we know that our clinicians have got um, expertise in managing those. So there's something around how we recognise long COVID as an entity, 
um, but that we also don't treat it as something that is completely standalone and unique and different to everything else, because there's commonalities and we need to actually, I think, empower some of our clinical staff to recognise the skills and knowledge that they do actually have in managing some of these presentations. So, so if we took something like breathlessness, and I know that's not the only major symptom, but it's one of them, and when I met a GP practice recently, they said that was the main one they were coming across. So, do, And they refer to a respiratory specialist. Does that respiratory specialist need more education or, or anything to do with long COVID, or can they just continue as normal dealing with the respiratory condition? Um, this is probably slightly... Yeah, about, it doesn't have to be you. I'll, well, I'll give you, yes. a broad, I'll give you my broad concept of that, is that if they are an expert in respiratory conditions, then they will investigate according to what, what their, their clinical pathways would be. Um, do they need something extra around long COVID? I, I think the honest, my honest answer would be I don't know at this stage. I think they have a breadth of skills that would allow them to manage the breathlessness that has been associated with, with long COVID. Okay, I don't know if any of the others want to come in on that point. Uh, yes, Professor yeah. th 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 Thanks very much indeed. And I think <coughs> you're, you're absolutely right, but I think these clinicians are the ones that will be, in, will be informing us of what they're seeing. Because you're, you're absolutely right, they've, they've, got, they've got the skills and I think what's been happening at local level in health boards is that one or two have been the key, the key link for the boards and are developing, developing that expertise and becoming the, the go-to person within that, that area. So they will be informing us back, so it will be a circular. Mm -hmm. and, and are there good networks both within Scotland and outside Scotland as well for these kind of specialists? I think there are good informal networks um, as part of preparation for today. We, we were discussing that with some of the, um, the key people that have been um, looking after both um, patients and colleagues with long COVID. And the, the, I think there are certainly informal networks that may um, formalise and hopefully will formalise in time. OK. Thank M you. Massini, I realise you're not in the room. Did, did you, was there anything you wanted to add to that part? Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess just in terms, again, of that national strategic network approach, one of the key tenets of, tenets of a national strategic network is, is a real focus on education and workforce. So we have developed an education at a fairly high level, to be, to be fair, education strategy. We've engaged with, uh, with clinicians who are supporting people with long COVID to, to identify what they feel they need in terms of that education and development. And a lot of, of what they're saying is it's about you know, being able to signpost appropriately to the right resources. It's about that peer support and being able to come together to discuss as a multidisciplinary team what the approaches could and should be. Um, so, so that's what the, the, the benefit of having that na national network enables us to do. It enables us to give people the time and the space to come together, to have those conversations, to, to learn from peers, to look at what's working and what's not. Um, and, and that will, will be an iterative process as we go through the network. Um, so the strategy is there. It's, as I say, it's at a fairly high level, but we'll be developing that over the over time within the network um, to ensure that it's fit for purpose. And again, taking in that voice of lived experience about what they feel um, is important to them. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Kavina. Thank you, Jim Fairley. Yeah, thank. <coughs> thank you, Kavina. Um, I'd just like to ask, what work has been undertaken to ensure that international good practice and learning is integrated into long COVID services in Scotland? Professor. <laughs> and as I look along the, the, the panel, I, am, I, am, I personally am unaware of what we're doing internationally with long COVID. I don't know if any of my other colleagues have got more experience, but that's something that we could come back with around that. Okay, Manir, I'll come to you first. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and just to give a little bit more kind of insights into what the long COVID CGIT network has started to do, we're producing 
monthly bulletins in which we're using our resource from Public Health Scotland to do, and that to really make concise information available and spread through the networks, the subgroups, and for onward cascade. And I agree with what um, my colleague just said there. We're learning here, um, and we're happy to share convener with you examples of that, if that, that would be helpful for the committee. Um, but that process will encompass not just what we're doing in Scotland or UK, but internationally, and available in bite-sized amounts that the communities and the multidisciplinary teams can learn and pick up good practice in what's happening across the globe. Thank you. OK, Linda. Uh, yep, yeah, really, the bulletin is so useful because it's, it's having the time to read and filter all of the research that's out there that's so important, and that, that bulletin does that for us. I just wanted to mention, not, not internationally, but UK-wide, is the Locomotion Study, which is the, I'll just read it, Long COVID Multidisciplinary Team Consortium Optimising Treatments and Services Across the NHS. And that's a national, and that's a national institute of health research, 10-site uh, ten, study that NHS Highland have just recently joined as the Scottish Board. And that just links us directly in and, and straight into our national network to the learning from nine English and one Welsh site, uh, Leeds, uh, University College, College London, Oxford, places that have had clinics for quite a while and we can pick up all that learning. Okay, it seems to me you all need to learn how to work out what are the bloody stimulate ICP. Does everybody know what that is? Uh, uh, anyway, sorry Janice, you wanted to come in. Yes, yeah, thank you. Just, I'd like just to reinforce around the, the publication of that bulletin. So great to hear from Linda that she's finding that helpful. Um, so that, that publication, as Manila said, pulls together um, a raft of research um, and information, um, and that's led by colleagues in Public Health Scotland. Um, also, the network's linked into the London Long COVID AHP network. So we are making those national links. And I think, again, as the network develops and we start to work through the work plans for each of these working groups, We'll start to, to look internationally to see how we can we can make links internationally as well. We've done that quite successfully in, in other strategic networks, and it's, it's a model that we know works. Um, so we'll, we'll be intending to look at that as the network develops. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gunnar. Thank you very much, Alex Riley. Yeah, thank you. Can I just come back on one issue? And it was picked up I think, <coughs> earlier, but it was from the last session. There was a suggestion that that there are third sector organisations out there such as chest, heart and stroke, that are geared up, can be doing a lot more, but almost like you know, a pushback from health boards. I mean, is, is, is there a good working relationship and does health boards you know, see the third sector as having a role? And therefore, what would be the issue with chest, heart and stroke? Linda, could I maybe...? Yeah, yeah sure. Well, we, we developed relationships very early on with a, with a well-known third sector group in NHS Ireland called Let's Get On With It Together or Lego It. And they already had modules around long COVID that we purchased licence for that, that, that you know, were accessing. So that, I think that was July 21 that some of our patients could access that. And the reason we've stayed with that local service, that they're involved with us in service planning, they have groups, they have peer networks, they have the wider, you know, they, they actually do sort of more you know activities and things like that and are and i think just being you know based in highland is really useful for that signposting and, and sort of collaborative working so that that is the way we've gone but we, we did that very early on so, so there is a view that that all these different organizations third sector out there we're using them we're utilizing them we're bringing them together would that be the general view or is there more we could be doing Marana? yeah I would always say there's always more that we can be doing in that space, but to give you reassurance for the committee, there is a lot that goes on that actually we don't get to see or hear about. So, for example, in primary care, um, and I'm, I'm, su I'm surprised when I was hearing the previous committee um, that wasn't mentioned that we they have the community link workers, do you know, and they are some of those unsung heroes that have those conversations where the, the GP might not have the time or the multidisciplinary team can go and then look at more urgent cases. And within those community link workers, you know, they're part of um, work that the Alliance are doing and the Alliance are part of our lived experience wider network um, is that um, good conversations are happening, referrals are being made. I think we can always improve on our data capture to be able to showcase that, that we're doing that. But I, I would like to say that there is a lot that's going on in the third sector that just happens. I think we have an opportunity to be able to capture that so that we can tell that narrative, tell that story back to the committee and others that work is happening. Um, um, and also 
um, just to reiterate, and Janice touched on it earlier, that we do have the alliance with the Lived, Exper uh, Lived Experience Network that's part of the long um, COVID strategic network. So we are really listening to the voices, really listening to individuals and their experiences and building that into every level of our network and decision-making process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And can I thank the witnesses for your time this morning? If witnesses would like to raise any further evidence with the committee, they can do so in writing, and the clerks will be happy to liaise with you on how to do this. The committee's next meeting will be on the 2nd of March, and we will continue our long COVID inquiry by looking into comparative approaches. That concludes the public part of our meeting this morning, and I suspend the meeting to allow the witnesses to leave and to move the meeting into private. Thank you.